It is truly an honor to be with you tonight. Again, I have traversed some 200 years of history to remind a forgetful nation of the legacy of faith and freedom that has been left to you. You were our posterity. We felt an obligation to leave you an inheritance. You know, isn't it sad that that, that is a concept that has been lost in our society, that we have an obligation to leave this nation better than we received it. And you can kind of see in all aspects of life that we have begun to degenerate, if you will. And the farther we get from this sword, which we talked about this morning, the more this nation will degenerate. I was somewhat concerned. I, I read a periodical that was published a few months ago and, and you have an interesting habit of naming generations. I find that quite fascinating. Um, I believe some of us blue hairs are, 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 are known as, uh, I believe Brother Ray said bombers. Uh, b boomers. Uh, boomers. And then there's the X generation and the Y generation. And, but in this periodical, do you know what they're calling the generation that is at our knee today? Generation Zero. Because for the first time in American history, we're leaving this generation with zero equity. Socially, economically, financially, academically, and most of all, spiritually. Your challenge tonight from your first president is to change the name of that generation to the blessed generation. There will be no generation zero on your watch. We have an obligation to leave an inheritance to those that come after us. And those inheritance come at a sacrifice, don't they? Anybody that leaves someone an inheritance. But that was a biblical concept. You would strive to leave something for your children so Maybe they didn't have to struggle as much as you did, and, and sometimes when that gets out of balance, it can become a negative effect, can't it? But prayerfully, consider how are you going to leave an inheritance and change the name of that generation to the blessed generation? So I started with the end in mind tonight, but I want to share a few things about the struggles that we had as a nation. As you know, our... Uh, First winter was horrible, the winter of 1776. It's interesting that the eight and a half years of our revolution were some of the coldest winters in recorded history of the time, in a hundred years. And you would think that the Lord would have mercy on us. Well, uh, if you really consider the uh, strategy of war, if you're a bunch of pitchfork-wielding farmers and you're fighting the most powerful military in the world, the British Army, the more exposure that you have to that army, the less likely you are to survive. And so, as was the custom in European style of warfare, as the months got colder, you would disengage from hostilities and go to winter quarters. So what a blessing when... Those cold winds from the north came early that year. And we decided to winter quarter at a place called Valley Forge. You may have heard of it, but my men did not call it Valley Forge. They called it the Valley of Death. You see, I was, the worst of it, I was losing 11 men a day, not to an adversary in a red coat, but to those persistent pestilence of man Starvation, exposure, and disease. You see, I had made a commitment to my army that I would clothe them and shelter them and feed them. Now, it wasn't opulent. <laughs> if you were in my army, we would pay you $7 a month for your service. And I would commit to you four ounces of apple cider, four ounces of dried salted meat, and one small apple. Now, that wasn't your morning ration or your evening ration. On top of your $7 a 
a month, you would receive this as your daily ration. And yet those men fought for the freedoms that you have. And yet here at Valley Forge, I could not even supply what I had committed to my men. When von Steubing, a Prussian captain, came over to assist us, and he did an amazing job. He put together the structure for drills and marching for our men. Do you know that the manual that von Steubing wrote for the U.S. Army is still used today in drill instruction in the United States military? That's how amazing he was. His father was one of the greatest generals of, of the Prussian army. When he came to Valley Forge and he saw the de deplorable conditions that my men literally were staying faithful to me to the point of death. I could not shelter them, I could not feed them, and I could not clothe them in the coldest winter in a hundred years. At the worst of it, I was losing 11 men a day. I wrote in my journal, under the crushing weight of responsibility that I find myself, I can no longer sustain my prayer vigil of an hour morning and evening. If you were here this morning, you heard that I committed the first and last hour of every day to prayer, arising at 4 a.m. and praying until 5. In the evenings, I would retire to my chambers, and from 9 until 10, those bookends to my day belong to the Lord. I wrote in my prayer journal, my daily sacrifice. That was going to be the beginning and ending of every day, but yet here I was, a losing 11 men a day, uh, Von Steubing said, I've never seen such faithfulness of any army anywhere in the history of the world. Those men were literally willing to stand there and starve to death for their general. I wrote in my journal under the crushing weight of responsibility, I can no longer sustain my prayer vigil of a morning and evening prayer. And so for the first time in my adult life, I changed my prayer habit. And I, and I began to pray one hour every morning. You understand, with everything going on, Brother Reyes, it was very difficult. And, and so I began to pray one hour every morning and two hours every evening. You see, I knew from which my strength would come, and it was not the abilities of George Washington. You want to see other evidence of that? July the 3rd, 1775, I was made commanding general of the Continental Army. On July the 4th, 1775, I wrote my first general order. And in that general order, I reminded the, the military of uh, all officers enlisted of the rules of the military against excessive drinking, gambling, womanizing, and brawling. And then I said this, this is my first general order. This is the first statement I've made to my army. And I fully intend that all officers and enlisted, unless engaged in actual battle, that they would attend divine services. What did I just tell my army to do? To go to church. It was interesting, over the next six weeks, I would discover a unit that uh, they weren't following these rules, and so I would write off, a reminder to their commander that I've heard that you're excessively drinking and maybe making their own libations. And I would remind the general of my first general order, I mean of the, the, the officer of my first general order. And I sent out numerous of these letters until finally General Nelson, one of my most trusted generals and a, and a fine man, he, he wrote back and as delicately as he could write to his superior, he said, Dear General Washington, so that I can convey your orders more succinctly, sir, what is the purpose of these orders? Reading between the lines, General Nelson was saying, don't you understand we're fighting the most powerful military in the world and you're talking about going to church? Sir, help me here. And so I helped him. I wrote back, oh, General Nelson. The purpose of these orders is so that we can present to Almighty God an army worthy of His blessing. 
And bless us, he did. He sustained us through that horrible winter. But now we're in 1777 and losing battle after battle. And we come up to those cold winds from the north again. And I had said, Congress, we cannot have another situation. Like we can't have a valley of death this year. And so they committed to, we will have supplies waiting for you, General Washington, when you get to Valley Forge. Well, we were running out of supplies, and it was getting cold, so we began to retreat from hostilities and head toward Valley Forge, hoping that the British would disengage and go to winter quarters. But tasting victory, they continued to press us and press us. And so what I wrote and considered one of the greatest battles of the Revolutionary War, the eight and a half years of fighting between us and the crown of England, was the Battle of Miller's Glen. That's what I wrote. If you're a war historian, you may think back and run through your files and you, you may say, I've never heard of the Battle of Miller's Glen. The reason you may not have heard of it, it wasn't a physical battle. It was the battle in the heart of one general that stands before you today. It's in the history books as the Battle of White Marsh. It was a rolling skirmish as we were trying to retreat and the British continued to press us. And before we knew it, we were six miles from the Delaware River where we had to cross and we would be in Valley Forge. But that's a dangerous situation to be up against that river. And I realized that the British soldiers were to our north and to our south and to the east. And if we got against that river, we were going to be pinned down. So we came to Miller's Glen, and it was kind of a high position that I felt we could fortify and defend. And so I told my 11,000 soldiers to stop and let's fortify this position. But we were out of food. And all of this vast column of supplies was on the north side of the British lines. So the first day, and my men were already weak from malnutrition and exposure, being pushed too hard. First day without any food. The second day without food, and you could see it began to take a toll on my men. My officers came together. We debated uh, what to do. We, we sent recon teams to probe the British lines, hoping we could find a, an alleyway to get the supplies to us. Finally, a dispatch miraculously made it through the British lines, and I thought, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you, you've given us relief. There's, uh, there's an army coming from the north to relieve us and to bring our supplies. So the dispatch writer handed me a satchel and I opened the secret note and unsealed it and it was from Congress, yes. So General Washington, in light of the great victory that the Lord has given us at Saratoga 45 days earlier, we are recommending that you offer a day of thanksgiving and prayer for this great victory. And my men have not eaten in two days. Some of my most trusted officers suggested that we just disband the army and try to sneak through the British lines as best we could. Some of us might escape. But we're going to starve to death if we stay here. Have you ever been so desperate that you just take the Lord's word and you just say, Lord, give me something. Give me something. I split the word of the Lord and it fell upon what is considered the Psalm of Psalms, Psalm 136. Oh Lord, would you help us? We need you. And as I began to read those words, the Lord began to convict me. Could I share with you just the first three or four verses of Psalm 136? I was crying out to the Lord, Lord, what should I do? 
I have this dispatch in my hand and I think it's ridiculous. And the Lord sends me here. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for His mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endureth forever. To Him who alone doth great wonders, for His mercy endureth forever. And I come under conviction, as the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, asked me, General, do you serve me for what I can do for you or because of who I am? I ask you the same question tonight. Do you serve the Lord for what he can do for you? Or when your back's up against the wall and you're surrounded by your enemies and some of you are feeling that way tonight, do you serve me because of what I can do for you? Or because of who I am. I knew what I had to do. I wrote my general order. Gather all the men on the parade grounds. Some of them were so infirmed already, over half of my army, if they, if they had attacked, we would not have been able to respond. Many on cots, unable to even stand. Meet on the parade grounds at 11 a.m. the next day. 11,000 men gathered in front of me. I could not even look at them. Now they've gone three days without food. Post general orders. As the recommendation of Congress, the general would ask that we offer a day of thanksgiving and praise for the great victory that the Lord has given us at Saratoga and because of who he is. And as he continued reading the verbiage of my general order, I, I began to hear a sound, a rustling, and it got louder and louder. And I thought, okay, here it comes. They're going to mutiny. They're going to take their general out and hang him from the highest tree right now. But that sound, that clanging that I heard was those faithful soldiers. They'd watched their compatriots starve to death the year before, and here they are three days without food, surrounded by their enemy. And their general asked them to offer a day of thanksgiving and prayer. Finally, I took the courage to look up, and that roaring sound that I heard was 11,000 sabers tapping the ground. As my men did not wait till noon, they took a knee at that moment and began to pray. Gathering around those that were on cots and praying for them. It was the most beautiful sight that this general had ever seen. God answered my prayer that day. Some prayed for 15 or 10 minutes and, and wandered back to their tents quietly. Some lingered for over an hour. I finally worked my way back to my tent where I continued to pray, God, give me wisdom. What do I do next, Lord? I was faithful in what I felt like you were telling me that to serve you and honor you even when things look so bleak. For your mercy endures forever, God, and whatever comes of this day, whether I'm to hang at the end of a British rope and my army is to f have the same fate, so be it, Lord, but I will honor you for who you are. As I was praying in my tent, I began to hear. At first, it was almost imperceivable, that, but in a, mo a moment, I could realize that my army was beginning to shout, Hussah! Hussah! Which is a cheer of joy in revolutionary America. And it became a roar, and so I burst out of my tent to see the most amazing sight that I've ever seen. Over the hill was coming the longest band of wagons loaded with our supplies, Brother Reyes. <laughs> Within an hour of my men's prayer, their prayer was answered. It took some months 
and some captive British soldiers to realize what had happened that day. You see, as my men were praying, and these recon teams, both from our side and from the supply side, were probing the British lines, and there were these small skirmishes. And finally, the leadership of the British army in their hearts and in their mind became fearful. They thought this must be the probing forward guard of a massive army coming from the north and we're about to get outmaneuvered and so we better retreat to winter quarters. And so the curtains parted and within an hour my men were eating their fill. Learned something of the power of an almighty God that day. And that battle would never be fought in the, ba- in the soul and heart of this general again. The Lord would lead us where he would lead us. But I will follow you to wherever you take me because of who you are, God. And not what you can do for me. It was later that evening that as I went to retire to my chambers and I noticed that my Bible was still open to Psalm 136. And I read the rest of that chapter and I was amazed at the last four verses. Would you join me? In verse 23 of Psalm 136, I was stunned as I read these words. Who remembered us in our lowest estate, for his mercy endures forever, and hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever, who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks Unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. There was more miracles that day. As my men were praying, we're eight hours time difference from Paris, France. Dr. Benjamin Franklin had been in Paris trying to conjole the French to recognize first our sovereignty as the right to become a free state. And he had struggled and struggled and really was not getting any foothold in that effort at all. Thirty minutes after my men started praying, there was a knock on his chamber door. It was a runner that said the, the leadership of France wishes to speak to you immediately. And so he had his nightshirt on, so he pulled on his trousers and his hat and his cloak and prepared his carriage, and off he went. What could be so important that they would come to his chambers at 8.30 at night? Dr. uh, Dr. Franklin, we just want to let you know that we have decided to recognize the sovereignty of the United States of America. And oh yeah, here is our Navy. It's at your beck and call. See, we had no Navy, and that's why Britain thought they had us in every way. Oh, brothers and sisters, we serve a mighty God. Don't make the mistake of serving Him because of what He can do and the way He makes you feel, but because of who He is. You want to rile the ur of this general? Let, let someone, one of my officers or one of my soldiers tell me that, oh, General, you know, I understand your, your faith and stuff, but me and the man upstairs have an understanding. Mm. They do not understand who they're dealing with, do they, Brother Ray? The mighty, most powerful God, the only God, our Creator, who created us for His glory. And sometimes the greatest glory we can give him is when we're squeezed, (laughs) is what I learned. Oh, respond to those things by bearing down on your faith in him, for his mercy endures forever. And it was actually that, that prayer, that battle of Miller's Glen that took place in this general that helped me to realize it's not about me, it's not about you. It's about His will. 
and how we can find that. And we, the founding fathers, as I shared this morning, we call that the hand of providence. <laughs> it's the hand of God upon us, and it's not something that's elusive that you have to go and beat the bushes for and try to find. It just takes an intentional effort to position yourself under His hand of protection, under that hand of providence. How do we do that? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Throughout this roadmap to life, this love letter to you and I, God's telling us how to live this life, no matter what comes, how to live this life. I pray that you will do that. You realize General Cornwallis, he, he wasn't too concerned about the colonial army. He was at Yorktown, and that had a beautiful port. And if things got too hot, he could just load up in his ships and sail away. No problem. America didn't have a navy until November 17th of 1777, at which point we had the, most, the second most powerful navy instantaneously because of that providential hand of God. But Cornwallis didn't know that at the time. Very interesting. We began to press, and it was a fortified city. How do you lay siege to a city? None of us had ever been trained in that. Von Steubing, who had studied his whole life under his father, who was considered the greatest master of the siege that lived in the entire world. And so he wasn't part of that initial meeting, and as we're trying to figure out what to do, as, as we're, we want to press in on Yorktown, and how do you besiege a city? And he walked into the tent, and he's like, what's going on? And we explained to him what was happening, and he said, no, 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 no. And he walked outside, and he, he snapped a, a branch off of a tree, and he came in, and he broke that branch into small pieces, and he began to, he said, you need to build a rampart here, you need to build a trench here. And then we, we build trenches vertically, and then you build another rampart, and he just sat on that map, and, and in an instant, he told us how to besiege Yorktown. It was a shock to Cornwallis and his men, how efficiently and effectively. You can go to the Smithsonian today and see that very map and those very twigs on that map. Quite fascinating. I would recommend it. And so as we began to close in and squeeze Cornwallis, it was amazing. A fog rolled in. Brother Reyes and I was just watching the story of the Battle of Long Island and where Washington was pinned down with his army. And the British decided, you know what, Let's, it's getting late in the afternoon. I want to retire for dinner and we'll come and mop them up in the morning. One of the thickest fogs that ever a man had seen and said you could literally not see your hand in front of you. That's a thick fog. That's a supernatural fog according, a fog according to the British soldiers that experienced it. And the longshoremen of Manhattan with burlap on their oars to make sure they didn't make any noise and they knew just how to row a boat where they didn't even make a splash. They rolled, uh, rolled 8,000 colonial soldiers right under the nose of the British Navy to safety. When the sun came up the next day and the fog lifted just as the last boat disappeared and the colonial army, Washington and his army had disappeared. Now the same thing happened. Here's Cornwallis pinned down and he realized he's in, in real trouble but he could just call in the Navy until the sun came up and he looked out and there was a Navy sitting, closing off the mouth to the port at Yorktown. At first he was reassured that, oh, okay, my Navy's here, good. And then he saw the flag on those ships. And it was the French Navy that had blockaded Yorktown, pinching off his only possible escape, until this fog rolled in, and he thought, maybe me and my officers can escape across the York River. And we'll get to New York. And so a thick fog came in and they got in the boats and they, just as they put themselves in the river and started across, 
the fog lifted. The curtain went away. They came under heavy fire and had to retreat back to Yorktown. And the great general of the British Army, the most powerful army in the world, had to surrender to a bunch of pitchfork-wielding farmers. For his mercy endureth forever. Oh, never forget that. This general never forgot it after that day. We serve a mighty God. He is so powerful. I shared this morning that this is the sword that won the war. And this is the sword that will win the war for this nation. But freedom is not free. I'll prepare you. Some will have to sacrifice. That Declaration of Independence that I challenged you that you had misnamed it, that it could have easily have been named the Declaration of Dependence because in its preamble it recognizes God that we're all created and we're created equal and that we're given inalienable rights by the laws of nature and nature's God which speaks of the God of the Bible. And then it says, we will no longer appeal to the crown of England but to the great judge of the world to weigh our cause, and if he finds it just, to bless it. And then at the very end, it said we will rely on divine providence, the hand of God. That is a declaration of dependence, sons and daughters, as much as it is a declaration of independence. But freedom isn't free. Some of you may know that of those 56 that signed, nine of them lost their lives during the revolution. 17 of them lost everything they had and many of them were quite wealthy. John Hancock, you remember that big signature in the middle? He was the president of that august body of delegates. Did you know that he is considered the wealthiest colonial in all 13 colonies? And how do you suppose, I keep forgetting that I have to stay here, sorry. How do you suppose that he made that wealth trading with England? And yet he was willing to sacrifice all of that for a very special group of people called posterity. Dr. Franklin, as he signed, he said, gentlemen, we must hang together or most assuredly we will hang separately. Benjamin Harrison. Benjamin Harrison, uh, uh, how do I say this delicately? He was fond of his fork. Uh, Benjamin Harris was six foot four and weighed over 400 pounds. But his best friend was Elbridge Gary, who was four foot ten and weighed 95 pounds, soaking wet. And they were inseparable. They did everything together. And so Benjamin Harrison couldn't resist his opportunity. He took the quill, and as he began to sign, he said, Elbridge, I have an advantage over you. With me, it will be over in seconds. He was speaking of the hanging. But you... You will be dancing on air for over an hour. They jested. But there was so much at stake. John Hart signed that document. Because of signing that, he had to hide in a cave in the depths of the forest, away from his plantation to keep his family hopefully safe. Word got back to John Hart that his wife, Elizabeth was gravely ill. And so risking his life, he snuck back to his own plantation house and some of his Tory neighbors saw him and reported him to the authorities and they said he only had about 20 precious minutes with his beloved Elizabeth before he had to retreat through his own garden as they fired on him back to his cave. He had 13 beautiful children. Sister Pam, they could play every instrument you can imagine and sing. I can remember Martha and I going and having a meal and then late into the night, their children entertaining us with their music abilities. It's beautiful. At the end of the war, John Hart came back to his plantation to find a fresh grave of his beloved wife, Elizabeth, who had died alone. Of his 13 children... We petitioned the British for years, and they never divulged what they did with his children. Shipped them off to England, we don't know. Two months after the war, 
Many say that John Hart just simply died of a broken heart and was buried next to his beloved Elizabeth. Freedom is not free. It comes at a price. Abraham Clark, signature down on the bottom, and it looks a little shaky as you read it, and it has a little swirl under it. That's how you can rec recognize it. Most of you have never heard of Abraham Clark. Abraham Clark, when he went to sign that document, it, those that were in witness said that he dipped his, the quill in the ink and then he began to write on parchment and, and his hand began to shake. <laughs> and the more he tried to steady it, the more it shook. And you could see the muscles in his jaw working as he tried to hold it still. And finally his face flushed red and he stepped back from that precious piece of paper we call the Declaration. He said, gentlemen, my hand may quiver, but my heart is steady. And he dipped that in ink, and he signed the declaration with that quivering hand. He had two strapping sons, fine young men. I made them officers in my Virginia 7th, my original unit in Virginia. They were captured at the Battle of Cowpens, and they were sent to prison, it's POW, it was called a prison ship. They would take the old riding hulk of a ship and set it out in the water so that they could not escape. It was called the Jersey. But it was foul place, literally rotting, full of every pestilence and rats and roaches and you can imagine. And plagues would sweep through the Jersey. It was so bad that in the eight and a half years of the Revolutionary War, they estimate that 11,000 patriots died from being sent to the Jersey. As they would do roll call every morning, the ones that had died in the night, they would just simply pick their bodies up and throw them over the side of the ship. They said sometimes when it was most horrific that the shore of Manhattan would be white with the bodies of patriots that had washed up on the Manhattan shore. And the stench was, you can imagine. This is where Abraham Clark's two sons were sent. And when it was discovered who their father was, the commander of the Jersey, the hell ship, as it was called, put Captain Clark, the oldest son, in solitary confinement and refused him food. He sat there with no food for a week. And then two weeks... And the British were beginning to get baffled as to how he was still alive. And finally, word got back to us of what was happening to Captain Clark. And so I wrote to my counterpart on the British side and explained that if uh, they do not relieve Captain Clark immediately, that I will go and find the highest ranking British officer, POW, and starve him to death. Is there something we could do? And immediately, after three weeks of no food, Captain Clark was put back in the general population. But before that happened, in week two, there'd been a knock on Abraham Clark's door. And everybody was praying for the Clark boys and the situation that they were in. People felt helpless except for God. And that, that's a pretty strong advocate. They came to Abraham Clark and they said, Mr. Clark, we have a proposition for you. And they handed him a parchment, and on that parchment was a, f a full pardon for him and his sons for the treason that they had committed. A large financial sum and passage to anywhere in the world that they wished to go, because of course they would not be able to stay in the colonies, traitors, if he would just do one thing, and that was to denounce signing that Declaration of Independence. And they say that as Abraham Clark stood there holding that parchment and considering his options, they said that that hand began to quiver again. And he mumbled something. And excitedly, they thought he finally, one of these 56, had agreed to denounce signing that document. Praise God. And so they leaned in and they said, excuse me, Mr. Clark, what did you say? And those that were witness that day said, almost like a caged animal, Abraham Clark said, I cannot. 
I cannot. He crushed it and handed it back to those British representatives and closed the door. Thinking that he had closed the door on the lives of his very sons. Sons and daughters, he did that for you. What are you willing to do to preserve the freedoms that you've been handed? Freedom isn't free. It's going to take sacrifice. To leave an inheritance to generation zero, to change their name to the blessed generation, it's going to take some blood, sweat, and tears and sacrifice. Are you willing to do it so that your posterity, your children, your grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren will know what freedom looks like at all? Are you willing to go back to the old paths that it speaks of so that you can find peace for your soul? That's what I challenge you with today. We're almost out of time. I would love to just uh, close in prayer, brother, and then we'll open for questions. The prayer you are about to hear is the prayer of a 21-year-old George Washington. As I recorded it in my prayer journal, which I named my daily sacrifice, Would you please join me as we pray? Almighty and eternal Lord God, the great creator of heaven and earth and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, look down from heaven in pity and compassion upon me, thy servant. I humbly prostrate myself before thee. I humbly beseech thee to be merciful to me in the free pardon of my sin for the sake of thy dear son, my only Savior, Jesus Christ, who came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Lord, write thy laws upon my heart. Help me to live righteously, soberly, and godly in this evil world. And make me to be humble, meek, patient, and contented. And in me the grace of thy Holy Spirit awaken. Lord, bless our rulers in church and state. And help all of those in adversity and affliction, giving them patience and sanctified use of their affliction. And in thy good time, deliverance from them. Forgive my enemies. Take me unto thy protection. Keep me in perfect peace which I ask in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you so much.